Shalom, friends. Uh, welcome to uh, the uh, webinar series that are offered to Jewish leadership. And I guess we wouldn't discriminate against anyone who joins this who does not happen to have to be Jewish. And we welcome everybody. Uh, but this is a webinar series that is sponsored by uh, Hidush, Ruach uh, Hidush, Rabbis and Kentas for Religious Freedom and Equality in Israel. And uh, we are uh, glad to have um, members from Ruach Hidush and from the Executive Committee on this uh, webinar. Uh, JPLAN, the Jewish Pluralism Legal Action Network, uh, and the American Association of Jewish Lawyers and Jurists. And uh, by now, with 92 participants, I am not entirely sure who is on the call, but I assume uh, the JPLAN uh, co chairs and uh, Stephen Greenwald, uh, the president of the American Association, uh, are uh, with us as well. I'm a here. couple of uh, words before we start. Ah, yes, Judge Peter Buxbaum, thank you. Uh, uh, Co-chair of JPLAN. Uh, so seeing uh, Peter on the screen, uh, let me just say that the next uh, webinar, and we are still trying to finalize the title and the uh, number of participants, but the next um, webinar will deal with a fascinating chapter in Israel's and America's legal history, uh, namely looking at uh, how did it come about that judicial review of legislative action uh, came to be uh, both in America with Marbury versus Madison and in Israel with the United Mizrahi Bank landmark decision. Uh, of course, it won't be just a, a journey into history, but it'll focus on the contemporary uh, issues that surround the judicial review in both communities, without which one may not fully understand some of the challenges uh, that Israel is facing today and some of the areas that are so important for us to safeguard uh, and support. And uh, Judge Baxbaum will moderate uh, that webinar. So stay tuned. Soon we will let you know the uh, details. Um, so um, write your questions, comments, etc. on the chat and uh, we will uh, start short uh, video uh, that is um, uh, that is demonstrating uh, the topic that uh, we'll be addressing today, uh, namely uh, the question of um, marriage freedom uh, in Israel. Uh, marriage freedom may sound like a sort of an uh, just one. Uh, issue of concern, but the truth of the matter is, it is the major issue of concern if we look at the extent of the violation of the intrusion into the basic civil liberties of Israel's citizens, and just as importantly, its impact on the uh, world Jewish community. Uh, and um, some of that you will be seeing uh, shortly, both on a a webinar, both on a, a, a documentary a video that we prepared uh, that uh, Professor Ruth Halperin Kedari, our uh, keynote speaker, uh, is participating in, and then uh, we'll enjoy about half an hour of uh, Professor Halperin Kedari's presentation on various aspects of this issue, and then open up and raise. Uh, some of the questions and comments uh, that you have shared with us on the chat. Uh, Professor Ruth Halpin Kadari is with us for, I think, the second time and hopefully not the last time. Uh, she is one of Israel's foremost experts uh, on issues of personal status and women's, um, uh, women's rights and gender equality, uh, founder and director of the uh, Ruth and Emmanuel Reckman uh, center at Barilan University Law School, and uh, anyone who knows anything about the um, challenges of religious contemporary life and pluralism and the battle for gender uh, equality, both in general and in particular uh, in the Orthodox Jewish community, 
uh, would know the name of Manny Reckman, the late Rabbi Manny Reckman, who was an inspiration to so many of us, uh, and really a giant that deserved uh, to have the uh, wonderful center that uh, Ruth Halpin Kadari heads uh, named for him and his uh, late wife. Uh, so Ruth, in addition to being a, a scholar uh, and, uh, and key advocate within Israel, uh, has a proud and impressive record in the global uh, arena uh, and served as vice chair uh, of the uh, uh, UN Commission on Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women and many other areas of her activity. So we'll start uh, with a video and then um, and then open up or and then transfer the uh, uh, transfer the um, uh, microphone uh, to Ruth Halpin Gadali. So this day is our story. We are the heroes. The decision to give a monopoly to the uh, Orthodox rabbinate it was based on the hope that the rabbis will understand that they have to soften up, they have to relax the strict laws and compromise with modernity. Over 600,000 Israeli citizens are denied the basic right of marriage. They can't marry at all in Israel. Over 350,000 Israeli citizens from the former Soviet Union, for whom world Jewry fought to gain them their freedom and enable them to come and reunite with our people in Israel. They are all Israeli citizens under the law of return. None of them can marry. Why? Because they have a Jewish father and a non-Jewish mother. I don't feel resentful for coming here at all, but I don't feel that I have to conform to exactly the identity that this idealized identity that's expected of me by uh, the institution, the system. And we are talking about converts. The irony, of course, is that whereas in the past it was only reform and conservative converts that the Israeli official rabbinate refused to recognize and therefore refused to allow to marry, but now it's also modern Orthodox conversions. When I came to Israel, it was the first time that anyone said to me that I wasn't Jewish. I had never heard that before. I just felt like someone had ripped out a huge part of my identity. None of these individuals who are all entitled to Israeli citizenship under the law of return or may have converted while they were already in Israel, none of them can legally marry in Israel. They receive citizenship, they are registered as Jews in the civil registration, population registry, and the rabbinate, which has the sole authority, monopoly over marriage of all Jews in Israel, couldn't care less. I grew up thinking that the state of Israel cared about the Jewish people. Uh, and I, I, I learned very quickly that um, that's not the case. חשבנו שאנחנו נוכל למצוא לזה איזשהו פתרון למרות אה, האיסור הזה ובאמת עשינו ניסיונות למצוא פתרון דרך הרבנות. הגענו גם לאחד מהראשי אה, עמותות שעוזרות לאנשים שנקרא קצת להנגיש את הרבנות ל, לקהל החילוני. נשאל אותי שאלות שאולי אחת מהן הייתה עוזרת לי להתיר את הכהונה שלי. הוא שאל אם יכול להיות שאימא שלי הייתה עם מישהו לפני אבא שלי. ו... וזה, עוד פעם, זה היה מתוך רצון לעזור. And if your name is Cohen, regardless of how you feel about it, you cannot legally marry in Israel with either a divorce or a female convert. אני לא עניתי, אני גם לא הלכתי ולא השפלתי את אימא שלי ולא שאלתי אותה את השאלה הזאת, אמרתי תודה רבה על העזרה. And of course we are talking about same sex couples and we are talking about ממזרים, illegitimacy, the black lists of the rabbinet that you can't free yourself of at all. You and your children will be doomed not to be able to legally marry in Israel. We got married uh, May 2014 in Copenhagen, Denmark, uh, because of the fact that we can't get married in Israel. And we actually got married in 
Yom Atzmaut in Independence Day. It was not in purpose, but it, it still had a, a very strong meaning of how come on the day that we celebrate our independence, our, our states and, and nationality uh, celebration, we have to get to another state to, to establish or, or to get a right that, that I, I think that ev every citizen should have. Consistent polling of public opinion in Israel. Ours and other organizations including the Central Bureau of Statistics, the Governmental Central Bureau of Statistics, show without exception, four out of every five secular Israeli Jews says, I would not marry in the rabbinate. All these religious systems in Israel, primarily Jewish law, which applies to uh, almost 80% um, of the Israeli population, is a patriarchal system which blatantly discriminates against women. I couldn't stand the notion that I, in the most significant moment of my life, uh, put myself in a position as an object that uh, the rights of her sexuality um, are bought uh, by her husband. <laughs> הוא זה שיחליט אם היא תתגרש, שזה אקט מאוד 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 משפיל. אני לא מכירה אף אישה שהייתה באקט הזה, ויצאה משם בלי תחושה מאוד מאוד קשה. אם את אישה יהודית שהייתה נותנת גושמנקה, הזכות של המדינה להתמודד עם אחד יהודי, ואתה יש לך לסנס ואתה מתמודד, um, then you also have the problem that if you want to get divorced, you have to have your husband has to be willing and available to actually physically deliver a divorce to you. So if your husband is incapacitated, incapacitated for any reason, if he was in an accident and he's in a coma, or if he's missing and he's or if he was abducted by a terrorist group, or if he simply doesn't want to give you a divorce, then you can be married forever. I don't feel that um, marrying him was religious in any way. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't at all related to me being Jewish or to him being Jewish. So I don't see what the Rabban... There had been solutions which were created along the way um, to bypass these limitations and try to ameliorate these uh, violations of human rights. So ranging from civil marriages which are conducted out of Israel and um, in line with um, Supreme Court precedents, couples who marry civilly out of Israel can later on register their marriages in Israel. Torli and I have a lot of young people, young people, homos, lesbians, young people, different things. אנחנו מחתנים אותם בטקס שייצרנו בהשראת שולמית אלוני שחיתנה אותנו. וזה טקס אחר, טקס שנותן לאישה את האפשרות לדבר. אין ספק שגם הטקס הוא בעייתי, ברור. אבל יש גם, בטקס יש גם דברים יפים פה ושם. פשוט צריך לנקות מהם את שלילת זכות האישה מלדבר שם בכלל, פחות או יותר, ו, ולפתוח אותו קצת יותר להקשבה אחד לשני. אני מחתן זוגות, אני פוגש הרבה זוגות. אני רואה הרבה זוגות שלא רוצים שהרבנות... תהיה אצלם בחתונה. הם לא רוצים שהרבנות תהיה אצלם בחתונה, במיוחד כי הם לא רוצים שהרבנות תהיה אצלם בגירושים. אז הם לא מתחתנים בכלל. כלומר, הם עורכים טקס נישואין, אבל מעדיפים להישאר רשומים כרווקים, או גרושים, או כל אחד מעניניו. העיקר לא לעבור ברבנות. אין לנו בעיה עם אלוהים, להפך. התורה שלנו והאמונה שלנו, יש לנו בעיה עם צוות הקרקע שלו ומה שהם עושים מזה. זה אלעד בן זוגי. אנחנו נשואים בפעם השנייה ללא רבנות, מתוך בחירה והבנה שאנחנו לא מתכוונים להיכנס למקום הזה שוב. ערכנו טקס שהוא... טקס יהודי אמיתי. לפי כל הכללים ושירה ברכות, ועם אורחים וחופה שהייתה לנו מאוד חשובה, אבל בסופו של דבר מי שערך אותה זה מי שאנחנו בחרנו. שהמילים שלו ושהמילים שלנו יתאימו לערכים 
ולאופי ולצביון המשפחתי היהודי, אבל uh, בלי אף אחד שיכפה עלינו uh, מלמעלה כל דבר אחר. When you look at this, the process and, and what it's become over the years, and I'm willing to give the benefit of a, of the, of a doubt that in the beginning the rabbinate was really trying to bring people closer, but now there, the rules and the stringencies that have been added are very clearly pushing people away and I, in some ways are not connected at all to halacha and to tradition. We created a website where we have uh, uploaded the findings of uh, research we conducted as to the status of marriage in all the countries of the world. And you take one look at the interactive map in the middle of the world, there is this black smudge that covers 45 countries that impose severe restrictions on the rights of their citizens to marry. 67% of them impose Sharia law on their citizens. The one and only democracy among them is Israel. I don't have faith in the political system because the political system is based on a purely proportional representation and this gives a disproportional power to the religious parties. But I have faith in the Israeli public, which one day will rebel against it and will de facto frustrate this law. And uh, this is happening in many, many cases. אני מאמין שבסופו של דבר יהיו במדינת ישראל נישואים אזרחיים באחת משתי האפשרויות או אפשרות שבה כולם יצטרכו נישואים אזרחיים מי שירצה רק יוסיף ויעשה גם טקס דתי או מה שבעיניי יותר סביר שבמדינת ישראל יקבלו את המודל שלפיו כל אחד בוחר לעצמו אם להתחתן בנישואים דתיים או בנישואים אזרחיים ובהתאם לבחירה לגבי נישואים כך הוא יהיה חייב לבחור לעצמו גם אם הוא מגיע Advancing marriage freedom is not only responding to a serious lack in civil liberties within Israel, in a, a, a respecting human dignity in Israel, but also an important step in bringing Israel to its authentic soul, to its core principles as a Jewish and democratic state. found uh, this uh, video uh, enlightening, uh, instructive, and in the follow-up uh, email where we will provide you with a copy of this webinar, uh, we will also provide you with a link um, to this uh, webinar uh, and uh, to this um, uh, documentary uh, video. Uh, one moment, one moment, I see that Just a second. Well, who would have believed that? You got the benefit of a few seconds of Gordon Ramsay uh, instructing you on uh, proper cooking methods. Uh, so uh, uh, soon uh, you will get the follow-up email with a link to this webinar and the link uh, to the documentary. And I urge you, rabbis, educators, communal leaders, use this video in order to launch a serious conversation 
um, and adult education program about the issues of marriage freedom. So, Ruth Halpern Gadari, the microphone is yours. Thank you so much, Uri, and thank you all for inviting me um, once again to your uh, very prestigious um, and uh, high level um, uh, lecture series. It, it is really a great honor for me to, to, to be here again and to talk about those issues which are of great concern to me both uh, personally and professionally and as Uri introduced me um, at the beginning of uh, this uh, webinar, uh, I think it's pretty clear that these are issues uh, with which I uh, deal with uh, for I guess um, almost 30 years now, that's a long time. <laughs> Um, so uh, I prepared um, a, a PowerPoint presentation. It, it, it will be easier for me to go through the key points and key questions and issues which I want to share with you today. And I already saw that there are a few questions on the chat and I hope that I will be able to address them uh, throughout the next uh, about uh, 25 minutes or, or so. Um, so let's, let's first start with some data. Um, I, we, we've seen this uh, very powerful video and there was already some data there, um, but I want to take you through um, official data from the um, uh, Central Bureau of Statistics, uh, which we at the Rackman Center uh, publish on a regular basis uh, every two years. Um, we have a publication, a statistical publication of um, uh, women, family and law um, in, in Israel. And there's one chapter there, obviously, about demography and about marriages and divorces. So this is one table that um, takes all those couples who marry out of Israel and segregates them according to the nature of the couples by religious affiliation. And as we will see in the next slide or, or two, um, those who are restricted from marrying in Israel, among others, are those who are interfaith, interreligious, or as sometimes they are being referred to, mixed couples, Jews and non-Jews. So um, the green line on top, you see that about 50% of those who marry abroad, who take the opportunity, the possibility of marrying out of Israel, as we've just seen in the movie, and, and, and as I'll explain uh, in a little while. Um, so among them, very um, uh, a steady uh, ratio of about 50%, half of them are couples who indeed cannot marry in Israel because they are mixed couples. Then below you see that about 20% of those, sorry, 20% of those who marry um, abroad are non-Jewish couple. And it's only about a third of those who marry each year out of Israel who both are Jewish couples. Now there is no way of knowing whether among those Jewish couples, namely those who are officially recognized as Jews in Israel, we have no way of knowing whether they have their own restrictions of marrying each other because say the man is a Kohen and the woman is a divorcee as we will see in, in a second and as was mentioned in the uh, video. Now the next slide of data, and that's the only data that I want to um, uh, use today, is the actual number, the crude number of people, of Israelis, of Israeli residents who travel out of Israel each year to marry. We have the data here until 2015. I just received yesterday the data that goes until 2019, and there's not much of a difference there. So you can see the green um, small um, uh, rectangle of green in each uh, column is the number of Israelis who marry abroad. And it's about um, 10,000 each year in 2017, it was actually 11,500. And in terms of the ratio among those who marry every year, 
it is in increase, a steady increase, but it never goes more than 15%. It, 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 is, it is up from 10% um, about a decade ago, now it's about 15%. So we can say that a steady 15% of Israelis each year marry abroad out of Israel. And as we've seen in the um, uh, last slide, half of them are mixed couples, Jews and non-Jews who cannot marry in Israel, and 20% um, are non-Jewish um, uh, couples. Now let's go to the basics. And by basics, I mean human rights. The right to marry is a universal human right. It is recognized as early as 1948 in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It has been reiterated in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, on the International Covenant on Economic, Cultural um, and Social Rights, in the International Convention on Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, in, in which I had the privilege of serving for 12 years. And this human right is also recognized as carrying with it the commitment of the state to ensure equality of rights and responsibilities of spouses as to marriage, during marriage, and at its dissolution. And very, very sadly, regrettably, the state of Israel violates its obligations under international human rights law by discriminating both on the basis of religion, of religious affiliation, and on the basis of sex. And how does it do that? Let's first take a look at the religious restrictions on the right to marry. So we have to differentiate between those restrictions that originate in the Torah, in biblical law, and as we call it in, in Hebrew, it's midoraita, and those restrictions that originate in rabbinic law, midrabanan. Okay, there is obviously a hierarchy between these two um, uh, sources of, of religious law. And within those who originate in biblical law, midoraita, the most common restriction, prohibition, is in fact a universal one. It's, it's, it's accepted as universally and not just as uh, animating from religious law, and that's the prohibition on incestuous relations. But under Jewish law, in addition to these restrictions, which are universally accepted, there is also the restriction of a married woman who has relations with another man. This restriction is in, on the same level of prohibition, of abhorrent prohibition, arayot midoraita, on the same level as incestuous relations. And it is only, of course, the married woman who is prohibited from having relations with another man. There is obviously no symmetry and there is no equivalent restriction and prohibition on a married man to have relations with another woman. That is not prohibited by Torah. And obviously we know our patriarchs, all of them had more than one wife. Shlomo HaMelech had 700 wives and then 300 uh, concubines, pilagshim, or I'm not sure how to pronounce that, that word. So obviously these are not restricted by Torah. They are restricted by rabbinic law, but again, because of the hierarchy of the origins of these restrictions, the effect of this restriction is completely different. Okay, so um, uh, just to, 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 to close these restrictions that animate from the Torah law, from the biblical law, same-sex relations are also prohibited on the same level of restriction and prohibition. And then we move on to those restrictions that originate in rabbinic law, midrabanan, and here we find the notorious Kohen and Grusha, Kohen and a divorcee, or also a convert, right? These couples are prohibited 
to marry each other. But, and here is an interesting twist that should be kept in our mind. If they do go on and conduct a marriage ceremony privately, even though it is prohibited legally, it has the effect of a valid marriage under Jewish law. The kiddushin, the betrothal, have an effect even though they are milchatchila, um, ab initio, they are prohibited retroactively, they have the effect of um, making a valid marital relationship. And, and we should bear that in mind. In, in, it, will, um, uh, uh, it will come very uh, relevant in the next uh, uh, slide or, or, or two. Um, then the other prohibitions from um, uh, rabbinic um, uh, law are the mamzer, who is prohibited to marry anybody else who is not a mamzer like him or herself. And um, uh, again, if they do conduct this marriage privately, it does have an effect. And then the other category, which is extremely pertinent in, in Israeli society, in any society, is that woman whom you recall was prohibited from having relations with another man who is not her husband. If she is divorced, she is precluded, she is prohibited from marrying that man with whom she had relationship when she was married. And bear in mind that these cases, they also include those women who cannot exit their marriages. These include the agunot, the women who are tied, who are locked in their marriages on account of their husband's refusal to give them the get, all, the, all those who are agunot and mesoravot get. If they finally do get divorced, if they had relations when they were still officially married, but probably lived apart, they are precluded from marrying their new uh, partners. And then there are other restrictions, religiously based all those restrictions that result from the inability to exit existing marriages, those agunot and mesoravot get, whom we just um, uh, uh, mentioned uh, now, and I'm stressing here the uneven discriminatory effect on women. And then there are those restrictions religiously based, as I mentioned before, of those mixed marriages. And these mixed marriages, they also include those who are Jews by any account, any personal identity, any community identity, but not Jewish under Orthodox Jewish law, not Jewish, not recognized as Jewish by Orthodox standards, which are the standards that have absolute exclusive control over marriages and divorce in Israel. Now let's go back to those restrictions of the incestuous relations and of married woman's relations with another man. These are relations that if they do take place and they do result in children of these relations, then these children are mamzerim. And it's important to remember that all other relations that are prohibited and, and that you see them here on this slide, they do not result in mamzerim. It's only these categories whose children um, uh, coming from these uh, illicit relations who are mamzerim. And again, we see this discriminatory asymmetric effect of a married woman who has relations with another man if she does have relations and she has children, then these children are mamzerim, and it's not the other way around. If a married man has relations with another woman who is not his wife, these relations are not illicit, and if he has children from these relations, they are not mamzerim. They are kosher Jews for every uh, effect. 
And this is just a slide of a very interesting um, uh, work project that involved exhibition and a book that the Rackman Center had together with um, uh, a very talented um, artist in Israel, Nurit Jacob Sinon. Um, and um, maybe Uri, I can also send you the link afterwards to um, that um, art exhibition and, and the book, it's, it's online. Um, and just to um, just to to um, wrap up the, uh, the the fate of the Aguna and the Mesorevet Get um, to remind everybody of the reality of um, Get extortion that goes on on a daily basis in Israel on account of these uh, unequal bargaining powers, unequal uh, power between the husband and the wife, where the husband can hold the wife chained to um, uh, maybe violent or simply unwanted uh, marriages. And we saw before that effect on the restrictions on remarriage and on um, uh, producing mamzerim. Now let's continue talking about the violation of the right to marry, okay? So we understand that Israel is violating uh, uh, Israelis' right to marry by simply not allowing them to marry in Israel because the only marriage which is recognized, officially recognized in Israel is the religious marriage. But then there are all those who are able to marry officially in Israel but they oppose the religious marriage. They oppose the forced religious marriage. Maybe they oppose the official rabbinate in Israel. And we already saw those um, uh, uh, snippets in, 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 the, in the video before, uh, those couples who said that they do not want the official rabbinate uh, taking over the most important moment in their intimate and, and personal um, lives. And, and we'll go back to them um, in, in a moment. So what are the solutions that the civil system provides to these restrictions and these abhorrent violations of human rights in Israel. How come, as we saw before, Professor Rubinstein said that um, he envisions that the public is going to rebel and uh, there is going to come an end to this uh, exclusive control of, um, of, of the rabbinate and of the uh, religious authorities and, and, and institutions over marriage and divorce um, uh, in Israel. How come it doesn't happen? So what, what I argue is that because the civil system, the civil legal system um, directed by the Israeli Supreme Court, High Court of Justice, and by um, uh, sometimes the legislator, the civil um, non-religious legislator, it is those solutions that were created along the way that in fact allow maintaining this problematic situation of exclusive control of religious marriage and divorce in Israel. It's those solutions, including the recognition of civil marriages out of Israel. And if you um, see the uh, Greek letters behind this um, happy, beautiful uh, kissing couple, this is, of course, a reference to all those marriages that take place in Cyprus, right? And we saw that it's about 15% of the marriages um, every year. So it is the recognition of um, marriages out of Israel coming back to Israel, being able to register them in the Ministry of Interior and in fact be recognized as married couple for all purposes, including for the purpose of getting divorced. In other words, and it is a very important fact to know many people are confused and are unaware of that, even if you opted out of religious marriage and flew to Cyprus or Prague or wherever and got civilly married, you are an Israeli resident and if you want to divorce in Israel, 
you must go through the rabbinical courts. And it's, it's a whole subject for, for a different uh, lecture and I won't go into more details uh, now, but there's no, it doesn't. So in other words, this solution of civil marriage is not a foolproof solution. And it's certainly not a foolproof solution for women who want to be guaranteed that they will never ever be in danger of refused a divorce or being in, in danger of being an aguna or mesorevet get. If you do want to guarantee that, and you really want absolutely no, no um, uh, um, confrontation whatsoever with the rabbinate, then your only solution is to live as a married couple without being officially married. And this is what we call de facto unions or in Hebrew, yeduim betzibur. And interestingly, Israeli legal system has the widest, the widest scheme for recognizing de facto unions and treating them for almost every purpose as equivalent to an unofficially married couple in Israel, except for the registration. And that also means that if you break up and you separate, you're simply just leaving the house or saying goodbye, it was nice and have a nice life. Of course, there are ramifications for that. There are economic ramifications. There's even the possibility of post-separation support payments and the children are not affected in any way. And that's also a very important fact to be aware of. Children of de facto couples are totally legitimate. There, there's nothing wrong with them. There's no problem whatsoever in their status, not in their social status, and also not in the relations, in the parental relations and obligations and commitments between parents and children. So that's another solution. And that's my, my argument among other things is exactly why because the, 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 the civil system was wise to offer these solutions and to go around these prohibitions and restrictions of the religious law, that there is no rebellion. And the most fascinating phenomena which we are witnessing in recent years is the growing rate of marriages out of the rabbinate. And here I chose this picture because many of these marriages out of the rabbinate is between gay people, same-sex couples, but it's not only them. And what's interesting is also that you can see in this picture that they, they break the, the, the glass, right? And there is a chupa above them. So that's one of the elements that um, I'm actually conducting a research that was funded by the Israeli um, Science Foundation um, into this phenomena, growing phenomena of marriages that are being conducted out of the rabbinate. And there are so many couples among them who actually seek the religious marriage. They want the religious marriage, they want the religious elements, they consider it part of their identity, personal identity, community identity, social identity, but they do not want the rabbinate. Some are unable to marry, like gay couples, but some are perfectly able to marry, but they want to do it privately and not with the presence, not under the auspice of the official Israeli uh, formal rabbinate. But there is a twist here and there is a danger here because if they conduct the private ceremony according to all the intricate um, uh, elements required by Jewish law. And if there is actually the process of the kinyan, where the husband betrothes the wife, gives her the ring or something equivalent to the ring, and pronouncing those words, harei at mekudeshet li betabad zukedat moshe Israel, that's the acquisition that's the actual legal process by which the woman, the wife, is now betrothed to the 
man to the husband. And if there is no get afterwards, if they want to separate, she must have a religious valid divorce, a religious valid get. Otherwise, religiously, she will be considered a married woman, an eshet ish, and will not be able to marry another person. Now, will that be the process under the actual formal Israeli law? We don't know yet. It's very complicated. I, I am aware that what I said just now is confusing and complex, but it just shows you the distorted and the, the twists that we are getting into because of this intermingling, because of this Gordian knot between the religious system and the um, uh, legal, uh, constitutional and legal system in, in Israel. Um, and uh, uh, let, let, let's see. Um, yeah, so one last element in this um, narrative is in realizing the growing phenomena of marriages conducted out of the rabbinate in Israel and seeing this rightly as a challenge, as an, an act maybe of civil disobedience against the control of the state and the control of the religious establishment, in 2013, the Knesset, the Israeli legislator, sneaked an amendment to a very um, old piece of legislation from actually from 1929, if I'm not mistaken, during the mandate uh, period, and made the religious marriages who are, which are conducted privately, made them into a criminal offense, which can be sanctioned by a maximum of two years imprisonment. So we got to the absurd result that conducting a religious, Jewish religious marriage privately in Israel is in fact a criminal offense. It was never enforced. And apparently, as we already can see in my research, it did not really have a chilling effect. They thought that it would have a chilling effect on, on, those, um, on those rabbis or, or public figures which are conducting those uh, private marriages, but they, they keep going on. So I just want to end my presentation and then open it up for questions with um, the pessimistic, but then I will finish with the optimistic message uh, as, as Uri, as Uri um, asked me to. Um, but my thesis is that if things continue as they do, we're not going to see civil marriages in Israel anytime soon. And the overt reason, the one which is usually proclaimed in political discussions, in the Knesset, in conferences, in writings, is that if we are going to allow civil marriages in Israel, it will completely split the Jewish people. The Jewish nation will go down the runes there will be a schism, there will be an irreparable split within the Jewish people. And I have a lot to answer to that. I will not go into that now because I want to suggest the covert reason, the one which I really think is underneath everything that I said until now. It's not just the religious law which has exclusive control over marriages and divorce in Israel. It's not just the Jewish law. It's every religious law in Israel, including the Sharia, which governs 18% of the Israeli population within Israel. And both Jewish law and Sharia law and ecclesiastical laws and Druze law and Bedouin tribal law, all of them, prevent interfaith marriages. They prevent mixed marriages. They serve as defense, as the border between one community and the other community. And it is the Israeli-Palestinian conflict that actually governs everything that we discuss now. 
because it is both nations, the Jewish nation in Israel and the Arab nation or nations in Israel, all of them have this interest of preventing intermarriages, of preventing these mixed interfaith marriages. But a democratic state, like Uri mentioned in the video, cannot legislate a law that says only Jew can marry a Jew, only Muslim can marry a Muslim, only Druze can marry a Druze. That's impossible. A democratic civil state cannot legislate such a law. But what we have in Israel is that the legislator, the allegedly civil, non-religious, secular legislator, simply gave over the control of marriages and divorces to the religious laws, the various religious laws. And excuse me for using this language, but it's the religious laws that do this dirty work for the politicians. Because all the politicians, or most of the politicians, most of the policymakers, on the two sides of this conflict, of the confrontation between Jews and Arab Palestinians in Israel, they all share the same interest of not allowing for the communities to mix together, of maintaining these borders and not allowing these mixed marriages. So is it going to change soon? Must it be that way? And this is the message that I want to end with. It's time to break this deadlock. But to break this deadlock, we need you. We need the other parts of the Jewish people, not those who live in Israel or not only those who live in Israel. It is of concern to all of us, to the whole Jewish peoplehood everywhere, to the whole Jewish nation. And one example of this is the um, IREP, the Israeli Religious Expression Platform, if I remember the acronyms uh, correctly, it's always very confusing. So this is one, one example, one good practice of really um, overcoming uh, hesitations and deciding to actually take a stand and encourage those of us in Israel, like Chidush, like the Rackman Center, like ITIM, like other civil society organizations who are working very, very hard to, um, to, to suppress and to, to end this deadlock. And uh, I'm just trying to um, do the stop share now, and I'm having some difficulties in doing that. Um, but I'll just um, go, on, go on talking. So this is really one good example, but we need, we need more of that and we need more help and more encouragement to um, join forces and together really end this deadlock and end this control that the religious laws um, have uh, exclusively over marriages and divorce in Israel and end this unacceptable violation of human rights um, in, in Israel. Um, thank you. Uh, Uri, I'm just... Um, I thank you, Professor Ruth Alfred Kadari. Uh, take you over have been, while I try to stop share. Yeah, very well, very well. <laughs> thank you. Uh, you have been as wonderful as I promised uh, our participants and uh, as those of you who know you, uh, those of us who know you um, have known even uh, without this webinar. Uh, not just wonderful in presenting a complex topic uh, within a short period of time to uh, an audience that is not uh, solely made of professionals, but also because of your tremendous advocacy uh, for the cause of religious freedom, of religious tolerance, of gender equality, uh, etc. Uh, and um, I will um, uh, raise some of the questions that have already um, been um, written uh, into the chat. Uh, and uh, first, uh, uh, and I'll, I'll make a couple of comments, but I want you to uh, think. One question had to do uh, with 
providing some more details as to how all of that uh, relates to the non-Jewish community in Israel, and not just in terms of uh, there is no civil marriage option or, as you mentioned, intermarriage, but can you shed some more light as to how the non-Jewish community relates to this challenge? Mm -hmm. uh, the other had to do with uh, does the, this issue, namely civil marriage overseas, cohabitation, etc., impact on, and if so, how, issues of child support, uh, child custody, uh, is it just, uh, you know, providing an equal alternative or are there complications and entanglement uh, and, uh, along the way? Mm -hmm. In the meantime, I'll just uh, make a couple of comments. First of all, we are honored to have Evelyn Canvin uh, on this webinar with us. Evelyn chairs IREP, the Israel Religious Expression Platform, and we are very uh, grateful to both IREP, as, as Ruth said, for its uh, pioneering role in advancing the cause of uh, marriage freedom in Israel. Um, and uh, the, the question is, can a rabbi who officiates at this uh, informal and non-registered marriage um, uh, perform a subsequent marriage for those, um, for the either of the spouses, uh, if uh, that uh, a couple did not uh, properly divorce? Uh, and, and uh, you know, th this reminds me that we'll hopefully soon uh, have a program that deals with a partially overlapping topic, namely the get law um, and the issue of prenuptial agreements. Um, and, uh, and when we do that, uh, you'll be able to see some of the comparisons between the situation in the US and the situation in Israel. But Evelyn, with regard to Israel, I can tell you one thing. None of the clearly orthodox, conservative, and I can tell you reform rabbis in Israel, and I don't know about reconstructionist rabbis who operate in Israel, I don't know what their position is, but none of the orthodox, conservative, or reform would remarry an individual who was religiously married prior to that uh, without a get. But, so it isn't just about the law. Uh, Yes. Evelyn. They perform a. Could the rabbi who performed this non-official halachic marriage also perform a halachic get? That was really the important oh, part. Oh, sorry, question. no. The, that the, was the, 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 what, what, if if they perform a, a marriage, why can't they perform a get related to that marriage, even if it's can. not official? They can, but it should be understood, and and maybe Ruth has a different perspective on that, but it should be understood that just as the marriage is not registered, so will surely the divorce not be registered. So to the extent that the couple and their friends and family are satisfied with that divorce, it could take place. Yeah, it seems uh, like and, we'll be around. And, definitely. And again, Ruth may want to relate to it. Uh, there is uh, another advocacy organization, uh, Mavoy Satum, Dead End, uh, that has worked with Rabbi Dr. Michael Avraham uh, and uh, with uh, Professor Daniel Sperber uh, and others to nullify marriage in instances where, in an instance where the uh, uh, husband was in a coma, for instance, and could not uh, provide a halachic get uh, and, um, and, uh, and other instances. Uh, these are indeed informal dissolutions of marriage, but the state uh, does not recognize them, the rabbinic courts refuse to recognize them, etc. In the follow-up email that we'll be sending you, I will refer to um, a, a section in our special dedicated um, website, uh, marriage.hidush.org, that is dedicated to the issue of marriage freedom and comparing the state of affairs in Israel to the rest of the world. But uh, one section there is a, a translation into English of things that were written by uh, Professor Aaron Barak, the former chief justice, in which he relates to this issue uh, and, uh, and makes the um, uh, case that the fact that marriage 
is controlled in Israel for Jews and non-Jews alike by religion is a violation of uh, civil liberties, a violation of human dignity, a violation of the principle of religious freedom, and a violation of the principle of equality. Now, one may attempt to justify all these violations, but I think that coming from the uh, pen or the keyboard of uh, the former Chief Justice Aaron Barak and explaining how serious the infringement of civ on civil liberties, etc., uh, emanates from what Ruth and our uh, video described uh, should be um, a matter of grave concern to all of us and the source of uh, activism and mobilization uh, toward the desired end uh, of realizing Israel's uh, mission as a Jewish and democratic state committing to religious freedom and equality to all and providing for uh, marriage freedom. So Ruth, um, non-Jews and, uh, and impact on children, custody, etc. Yeah, okay. Um, I also took a quick look. Um, there were many, many questions uh, in the chat and uh, if we really wanted to address all of them, uh, we would stay here um, in Israel time until midnight. Um, and, 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 some, and some of the questions here are really very complex ones that uh, I couldn't even give a, a, a straight answer off the top of my head. And some simply do not even have answers, clear answers. They, um, the, there's, there's case law, there's conflicting case law, and there are a lot, a lot of uncertainties uh, in, this, in this area. Um, but one thing in, is certain, and I'll start with that issue of the children. Whatever the relations that took place between the parents, whatever the nature of the relations, whether they were formal marriage or informal marriage, civil marriage out of Israel, or de facto cohabitation, or private religious marriage, or private non-religious marriage, doesn't matter. The status of the children is the same. And that's really interesting. And I know that for people coming from the common law countries, tradition where illegitimate child, the concept of illegitimate child really reigned until not very long ago, I think 70s, 80s, in some states, maybe even during the 90s. Um, so this is actually um, uh, probably surprising. Um, and maybe doesn't even go in line with all the prohibitive nature and the restrictions that we were talking about and the illiberal nature, of course, of the, of the religious laws. But in terms of the status of the children, their rights vis-a-vis -vis their parents and the relationship of the parents between them in terms of their parental obligations and commitments to the children, they are exactly the same, no matter what the nature of the parental relations were. Um, so, so that's, I, I hope this really um, um, satisfies these uh, concerns about um, children and children's rights. That also includes child support, right? Child support and right to inheritance, uh, everything, and custody, obviously. Um, now, non-Jewish communities, so um, as I also try to um, say uh, very um, uh, succinctly in the, in the video, um, all the religious laws in Israel, they can really compete in the, their degree of patriarchy and in the degree of uh, how discriminatory they are against uh, women. And I'm not sure which one would um, receive the first place. Um, so Sharia law is also extremely discriminatory against women, Druze law likewise. Um, ecclesiastical laws, um, church laws, they differ, maybe they are not as uh, problematic, but bear in mind that throughout the religious um, uh, court systems in, in, in Israel, all the religious courts have one thing in common they're totally male dominated. There are no women religious judges, whether it is the rabbinic courts or the Sharia courts or the Druze courts. 
And that's already um, obviously uh, an extremely blatant discrimination and violation of um, all the human rights uh, obligations and uh, conventions which Israel is party to. Um, now, in terms of, um, of, of how the women within the non-Jewish communities, how they fare, um, this really raises a very interesting debate, um, which falls into what, what we call the multicultural debate and the problem of the minority within the minority. Because Palestinian, Arab Palestinians in Israel are a minority. There are a um, um, minority which is discriminated against on many fronts, on many accounts. And for some of them, maintaining this autonomy in terms of uh, personal status laws, in terms of maintaining the religious legal autonomy over marriages and divorce is a sign of, um, of, of, of community rights, is a sign of their um, uh, 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 identity, political identity within. And so those women who try to uh, rebel from within and who try to advance women's rights and um, decrease the level, the control of the Sharia courts over issues of marriages and divorces, they are very often perceived as betraying their community and as cooperating with the um, Zionist Jewish um, occupier and and uh, and and uh, the the forces that uh, oppose the Palestinian um, uh, independence and and autonomous identity. So they are really locked in a very very um, difficult, um, impossible situation. And um, I again, it's it's a it's a subject for a whole different conversation, but um, what I'm trying to say is that um, we share many of the predicaments of women who live under religious laws, but the Palestinian Arab women are really being um, confronted by even more complex challenges than uh, we Jewish women uh, face within our own communities. Um, uh, I think there was, there was this issue of whether those um, rabbis who conduct the private marriages outside the rabbinate, whether they can conduct um, divorces. So like Uli said, theoretically they can, and uh, apparently it's not only Harav Sperber, um, by, the, by, the, by the way, Harav Michael Abraham, I think, is no longer interested in being involved in these uh, issues, but, um, but uh, Harav Professor uh, Daniel Sperber, um, uh, Israel Prize Laureate, um, is, is, is really a leader in this uh, area. And he's not alone. There are others whom um, actually prefer uh, not to be uh, publicly uh, known. Now, as Uri said, if everything is being conducted privately, and if there is agreement between the couples to separate after they were halachically but privately married and they agree together to separate, then they will have those um, rebellious um, Orthodox rabbis who will agree to conduct their um, divorces halachically for them. But if things go badly and if the man, the husband 
turns into being um, violent uh, or simply coercively controlling his wife and refuses to cooperate in the divorce, then again, excuse my language here, but good luck to her. She will really find herself in a dead end because if she goes to the rabbinical, the state official rabbinical court, she's not going to find a sympathetic ear there because she opted out, right? She opposed them, she rebelled against them. Um, so, so that is why, at least at the Rackman Center, um, we are, we're still very um, apprehensive about that. And personally, I have mixed feelings. I'm, I'm all for encouraging that, but uh, I mean, this process of, uh, of civil disobedience and, and, and uh, increasing this trend of um, marriages out of the rabbinate, but at the same time, I'm very much aware of the, of the dangers there. Well, Ruth, uh, let me put you on the spot. Uh, first of all, we are very grateful to the Reckman Center for co-sponsoring this webinar with us or any second uh, webinar that we are co-sponsoring, reminding people that you can still watch uh, Ruth speaking about the COVID-19 and its impact on women and comparing the situation in Israel to uh, some other uh, areas in the world. Uh, but uh, this has generated tremendous interests, many questions, and obviously we are losing many of our people who have scheduled other things uh, following uh, our uh, program. Um, and what I suggest is, if you're willing uh, to soon hold a second part uh, to this webinar and basically list the questions that are important, that, are, that have an impact, uh, and, um, and inform both those, all those who registered, the 180 plus people who registered, and, uh, and uh, publicize the opportunity to have you uh, respond to additional issues uh, that there is no way we can do justice to now. So if you would be willing to, um, let's plan, uh, for those who are still with us and we'll announce it, let's plan a second uh, round uh, of this webinar very soon uh, and uh, we'll be able to respond to additional questions that have been uh, raised here. So for the time being, thank you, Ruth. Uh, thank you all for being with us. And we really appreciate the uh, IRET, the Israel Religious Expression Platform, um, presence in this webinar um, and, uh, and applaud you for the initiative to join hands with us in Israel and advance marriage uh, freedom uh, in Israel. Uh, we'll announce soon the next webinar that will deal with a constitutional issue, but at the same time, a political and existential issue uh, that's facing Israel and not just Israel, namely uh, uh, the issue of the Supreme Court versus uh, politics um, and the division of power in a democracy at, uh, and, and the current challenges in Israel. Thank you all for participating and uh, we'll follow up, uh, as I said, with both information about the video you received and you, we, we displayed the special website, uh, the, uh, if Ruth will want to add her PowerPoint and other resources of the Rekman Center, including the book uh, on Mamzerim. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll be delighted to do so. Shalom to you all. And as uh, Becky Caspi said when she um, uh, had to leave, stay safe and healthy. Shalom until the next time. Bye, Uri. Bye-bye. Take it easy. Be well, honey. Bye-bye.